One of the main events that we run at Because Jewish is called the Friday Night Jam. We're along with Editor-in-Chief Mike Greenhouse of Relics Magazine. We get together uh, with musicians and artists and talk about what matters to them religiously and musically. Uh, and so because tonight is Purim and Noah is putting on this grateful Purim show... With Dave, Brian, and friends. With Dave, Brian, and friends, we thought we would have a little bit of a conversation about the holiday of Purim and why we have chosen this night to talk with Noah and to play some dead music. And so, we're happy to have you with us. We're going to take some questions, a little bit of Q&A. The point of Purim is to get so drunk that you can't tell the difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. <laughs> That's pretty drunk. That is pretty... Uh, <laughs> uh, the idea is that we are to remove any doubt that we might have in our lives. Haman. Ooh. He is the evil guy in the story who is trying to stamp out all of the uh, good Jewish people from the land of Shushan. And with the help of uh, Queen Esther and Mordechai, uh, the Jewish people are able to persevere and to do battle and to win and to save their own hide. Uh, that is uncommon in a lot of Jewish stories. In most of the Jewish stories it goes, uh, we perished, uh, we suffered, now let's eat. Here in this story, the story is flipped on its head. And that inversion of the story and that turning things upside down is what we're going to try to do tonight here. What Noah's going to try to do with his music and what Mike and I are going to try to figure out why the Grateful Dead What's the connection? And really, why do um, so many people find a power in both the music of the Grateful Dead and in great biblical stories? So it's great to have you, Noah, and thank you, Mike, for joining us. Awesome. Is it just on? Okay, we're on here. Great. Well, you know, as Dan said, we're celebrating both Purim and the music of the Grateful Dead tonight. And, you know, much like uh, Purim, uh, you know, there's definitely a through a looking glass mentality to the dance music and the whole culture around it. And I know for you, Dan, uh, you know, Purim was really the way you got into the Grateful Dead's yes. music about a year ago when we did a similar event with, with Parapin, uh Family Band at Brooklyn Bowl. So I was wondering if you could start by giving us a little background on kind of some of the parallels you found with the dance music Great. and their culture and kind of the meaning of Great. the Purim. Great, yeah, Sorry. no, thank you. So about a year ago, so I, um, Okay, so this is a little embarrassing. I grew up a Pearl Jam fan. I was a member of the Pearl Jam fan club for at least 15, maybe 20 years, uh, embarrassingly so. Uh, and I was not uh, a huge deadhead. And so, but I... Well, I, no, I this ain't hate it. Nobody's people, perfect. Nobody's perfect. People can change. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just Brooke so we're clear. Brooke has said, people can change. There we go. So, uh, since we've been creating, so uh, Mike and I lead High Holiday Services at Brooklyn Bowl, uh, for example, with J uh, Jeremiah Lockwood of the Sway Machinery, and we also do these events, as we mentioned, the Friday Night Jam with different, uh, we had Sin Kane come, we had Chris Robinson up at Garcia's, and we did uh, Craig Finn from The Hold Steady, and they sit around and they talk about their spirituality. So a year ago, we did Purim at Brooklyn Bowl with uh, Graham Lesh and the Terrapin Family Band. Uh, and so I'm the rabbi, so I have to tell the story of Purim through the lens of the Grateful Dead. Well, I don't, that sounds complicated. Uh, and, and so I met with a good uh, professor of Talmud, friend of mine, who also happens to be a fan of the Grateful Dead and other things surrounding the Grateful Dead. And I said to him, uh, what uh, explains to me the connection between the Grateful Dead and Purim? And he said, it's all about scarlet begonias. <laughs> because he said the thing about the book of Esther is God's name is not mentioned at any point in the book of Esther. That it was up to Esther to see God and divinity and holiness in this world. You didn't see it on its face. You had to look for it. And so he said sometimes, uh, once in a while, uh, you can get shown the light in the strangest of places if you look at it right. And so using Scarlet Begonias as our linchpin of what the holiday of Purim was all about, we then used Friend of the Devil for Haman, we used Dancing in the Streets for the big party that happens at the front, uh, we, we used Touch of Grey because at the end uh, the Jews survive. And okay, so that was fun, we had a great time, there were a lot of kids there, and then I just kept listening to the dead over and over and over again, and the dead started to flow through me, and then I went to see Dead and Company. Uh, Andrew was at that show. I went to see Dead and Company to, at MSG, and a friend of mine I brought with me was sitting next to me. He goes, ah, this is just for people who want to get high and do drugs. And I said, you're missing it. I said, everybody here, they're sharing poetry and liturgy that they've lived their whole life. 
that they've shared with their family. I said, this is a high holiday experience for people. I said, you're totally missing it. And then the wildest thing that happened is I had never brought myself to listen to the final uh, July 9th uh, a Soldier Field show. I just couldn't get around. I mean, listened to a lot of other dead shows, but I just, I didn't have the stomach to finally listen to that last show until my rabbi died just two months ago. And I was devastated because he was my rabbi and my professor. And I remember after he died, after his funeral, I went home and I listened finally to that last Grateful Dead show from July 9th at Soldier Field. And I realized at that point, I had totally become a deadhead. Uh, so I want to thank Mike and I want to thank Relics. Because for me, that was the power. That's right. A hundred percent. Yeah, that's an amazing story. Yeah. Was, you, know, you know, for me... You know, when I was first asked to play the dead, you know, tonight and realized it was part of, I was like, there couldn't be a more perfect Jewish holiday in which to do it. Um, you know, in many ways, I feel like Purim kind of like was with the original acid test that right. that, that Dan and Mary Franks were doing back in the day. Um, what, was like, the, what was in the humatash? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, nobody eat the brown humatash. It's just bad humatash. It's not poison. Uh, uh, I think Rabbi Dan mentioned, you know, one of the, the main practices of the day is to get uh, intoxicate ourselves so much that we can't tell, you know, the difference between uh, Hillary Clinton and, and, and Trump or, 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 uh, <laughs> or, or Mordechai the Sadiq and Hamid the Rasha. By the way, you can, you, you can celebrate Purim uh, uh, drunk, but please vote sober. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very important. And, you know, what we're doing, uh, and what we're doing is we're taking this kind of Ration, dualistic rationality that we always apply to the everyday life when we try to say everything better this or that and you know which we first got back in the day when we ate that fruit off of the tree of knowledge and good of evil and went from that kind of unified consciousness where we could see everything the way it was into this reality and in fact uh, the Talmud tells us that where can we find Haman in the Torah in in, in, in the words Hamina ate from the tree yeah. That's right. There we go. And Haman also kind of represents that dualistic consciousness. And when, you, when we get so drunk that we're able to, to kind of confound that duality, we're able to access kind of that primordial truth and that kind of primordial understanding that, that you know, nothing was ever mundane. It's all always divided and all right. one. And that's very much, I think, what, you know, the dead and the pranksters were trying to do back in the day uh, of the acid tests when they were bringing together, you know, a youth that kind of was searching for for a, a deeper reality than they saw in the culture around them and was trying to explore it. And they are just, just as, as here, you know, we're, we're using intoxicants. Um, they also use that, but in a very powerful way, I think they also use their music. Right. Right? And I think that the practice of the dead music is very much about an exercise and kind of transcending duality, whether it's that kind of creative tension between the structure and the improvisation, or kind of, or, or kind of just breaking down the barrier between the performer and the audience. And you know, as a drummer and musician, you know, like, I, that's, that's exactly what we're very physically doing. As a drummer, I'm taking sound and silence, the left hand and the right hand, these seeming oppositions, and bringing them together in that, in that tension and unity, and hopefully making some, some meaning, and hopefully making some butt shake, too, while, while, <laughs> while that's happening there, too. And also for the audience, too, like in their, in their brains, they're listening to sound and silence, and, mm -hmm. but they're hearing music, so they're also and transcending that reality and making, and making the universe. And that's the way the Jewish tradition understands the whole process of creation, that tension between form and structure, yes. you know, chesed and gabora. And I also got also have a bit of a physics background, and as a drummer, that's also very important because, you know, there's a lot of physics in there, too. And in the, in the world, too, you have a proton and an electron, positive and negative charge that come into tension and create the, the, the physical space of the world. And, you know, on Torah, hopefully we're creating the cognitive and the moral space. and. Uh, and with the music, hopefully we're creating a good dance space for you all. <laughs> yeah. No, no, uh, you know, Dan is a new addition to the Grateful Dead family. You're a veteran. You know, you've, you've, you know, you've, you've grown up in this world, and it's, uh, you know, it's been your lens to discover a lot of different things. Um, you know, of, of course, the, the funny thing about so many deadheads being, you know, from a Jewish background is there's only one member of the Grateful Dead who was, who was you know, raised Jewish. Um, you know, in your, in your, you know, personal discovery and in your own research, you know, why do you feel that the lyrics of the dead in specific, you know, are, are so um, inspirational to Jewish people and have always really been this kind of connector for people in the spiritual path? Yeah, well, um, good God, uh, that's a big question. You know, in many ways, I think, as I said, they're, they're tackling a lot of kind of the same themes uh, 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 that Judaism has always been exploring, kind of, kind of, you know, that confounding of duality, whether it's the bittersweet attachment to, to you know, within all the love songs, 
whether it's seeing that the sky is yellow and the sun is blue, you know, a lot of the time when we are sort of reaching out for that sacred space. Um, you know, in many ways, I think e even kind of the, the very name of the Grateful Dead kind of inspired yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, 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 yeah, yeah too, um, uh, you know, uh, there's a, there's a saying, and there's a, there's a tradition that like when when you speak the teachings of your rabbi, his lips move in the grave. And I feel very much like when we're playing Jerry's tunes, his fingers are are, are, are playing there too. And you know, it's about that change of transmission, which goes back, I, I, I think, you know, a lot a lot further even than 1965. I, I, I often like to say like dead shows have been going on for thousands of years, and thousands of years, you know, when we were in our own, you know, when we were back in, in, in Israel, back in the old days, you know, three times a year we'd go on our pilgrimage to Jerusalem and have that experience. We'd go to a place where there'd be a big light and sound show. There's always music. There, 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 there's a lot of smoke, uh, a lot of thunder and lightning um, going on there, too. And we'd meet a community around that experience that we don't, weren't necessarily with the rest of the year. Uh, and we'd come out of our, our daily reality to really find our true essence. And that's the experience that I think the dead, the, the dead community reinvented for, for us sure. and, and afforded us. And, and uh, that's the ethos they really permeated. I mean, think about like, uh, uh, I know John, we just lost John Barlow, and, and he was a basic lyrical influence. And, and you know, he wrote half of Weather Report Suite. Right. And, yeah, but both halves of it are so amazing and, and, and so deep and sawed so deeply and richly from, from our own tradition. Uh, and even when the dead are, are talking beyond that, you know, I think, I think we're able to touch into kind of like the, the liturgical quality and kind of bring that into beyond just our own Jewish community and help us realize that like B'nai, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel are also all children of Noah. Uh, and you know, it affords kind of a way for us to tap into not only our own Jewish spirituality, but for us to connect spiritually to that greater community you know, and see kind of, it's also kind of pointing to what Judaism is pointing to. You know. Uh, yeah, no, I love that. In fact, uh, the story is that when uh, Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, uh, the first time he asked, he said, let my people go so they can go off and have a three-day festival in the woods. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. He says, let my people go so they can go for three days in the woods and worship you, sort of like a festival, like a fish show. And Pharaoh said, no. He didn't say, let my people go to get out of Dodge. He said, let my people go for three days because Pharaoh understood I guess intuitively that if you give three people, if you give people a time to get away from their lives, from, get away from all the work, to gather up with their friends and hear some music and to connect with something powerful, they might come back wholly different people entirely. And that even giving them the potential to do that is far too dangerous. Uh, and I think that that's what a lot of us are missing in this world. I think, you know, as someone who came to the Grateful Dead later in life, um, I think we are inundated with technology and social media and our work and from all sides. You can't really go anywhere where you can escape Wi-Fi or any of those things. And so the idea of having two and a half hours, you know, two hours and 45 minutes with drums in space, like the, hour, the, the idea of having two hours and 45 minutes in a separate space distinct from what's going on, or at least the pacing of the rest of the world where you can tap into something higher, uh, and then hopefully in the process of getting away from being stuck in the day-to-day, -day, we can bring, when we return to the day-to-day, -day, we can have a little bit more enlightened or leavened view of what's going on. Just, just another point you're asking about kind of the lyrical quality and how that relates to the Jewish experience is like the dead community is a community that's living in relationship with a text, yeah. which is the dead canon in very much the same way that, that we, the Jewish community has been doing for thousands of years. And just as I think we, we all know what we've done here, we're always in our course of our daily lives, we're always trying to weave lyrics in, in the appropriate yeah. place. Just like when you read the Gemara, the rabbis are always trying to find the right you know verse from the Torah to apply to the situation uh, or not. And, uh, you know, kind of like, it's hard to find kind of that resonance in other communities, and, and, and the dead is really one place where we do it. And I would add to that that, you know, at least the original Grateful Dead community and, and the members of the band themselves did grow out of the, the bohemian folk community, which was, you know, you know, the beatnik and the outcast community, which at that point in particular in the 60s was very heavily Jewish because it was a place that 
for people who did not fit into the norm, and I think that that inspired them, even if it wasn't a religious way, it was a cultural way. You know, I've always really liked um, Purim for a lot of different reasons, but one of the reasons I always really like it is that it's one of the few Jewish holidays where you see um, Jewish people interacting with non-Jewish people in both negative and positive ways. And when there's that positive way is when there's the reveal that I am Jewish, there's people who are like, oh, I am too, and there's a, there's a shared language and a shared bond, and I think that's something very similar to the Grateful Dead world. When you meet someone who loves the dead, just like anyone who loved any passion, in a band, you, you have a secret language, you have a, you have a wink, you understand each other in a different way, and I've always seen that in the book of Esther. Would you, would you guys agree with that? Or? No, absolutely. Like, whenever I'm, I'm traveling on tour and I'm yeah. going to a show and I'm in an airport and I see someone stealing, you know, I have the same feeling is like when, when I'm off somewhere and I see someone with a yarmulke, you know, right. I'm like, oh, it's my people, yeah, it's yeah. my time there too. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, just like, just like you know, the Jews have, have, have been in exile for thousands of years, and, and you know, always are some ways kind of like in disguise in the rest yeah. of the world that have a true identity. I think a lot of deadheads, I think, very much feel the feel the same way, kind of in, in our, our modern uh, American society. Yeah, I like that. I like that that notion of sort of revealing yourself. I mean, so in the Book of Esther, that's the central reveal. Like, Esther has to come clean about who she is. Like, if she, in order to save the people, she's been in hiding as a Jewess as a Jewess, as a Jewish woman, uh, and that in order to save the Jewish people, she has to tell the king that she is Jewish and that this evil henchman named Haman is out to kill all the booze. There you go. Um, and when you think about that, like, there is something about the Grateful Dead and where, I mean, I was just, as I mentioned, I was a dead coach, just like, all people are there who are free to express themselves. So you've got like the hippie people who are still dressed as if it's 1968 who are there. You've got the orthodox people who are dressed full in their orthodox gear. People are able to come as they are and there's a beautiful melting pot. So everyone is there sort of loving the music but they're all also expressing their individual identity. And I wanted to ask you, though, vis-a-vis -vis playing the music of the dead and then translating it, because I do think the connection between, like, when Jews lead services, right, those, those prayers were written a long, long time ago. And so, to a certain extent, there's a, a danger of becoming rote or formulaic and just going through the motions. And so nobody wants to hear a dead cover band that is going to play every lick precisely as Jerry played it or as Phil We're glad to hear you say that. <laughs> uh, uh, because there also has to be some part of you um, that enters into that space. And I think the best religious practices or the best Jewish rituals are ones in which we can share the old prayers but make them relevant to what's going on now. So I'm, I'm curious, how do you take the Grateful Dead music in their canon and make it alive as opposed to stale? Well, that, that, that's, yeah, yeah, that's the whole exercise. You know, there's a saying, the Torah, lo me, the Torah is not in heaven. You know, the Torah is, is living and here on earth, it's a living tradition. And that's why we keep playing that music, you know? That's why we're not, we don't all just go and back and listen to all the tape we have. Um, and, and as a performer, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, as a performer, you know, it's the same way, you, you know, as, you know uh, religiously when we pray, we always start, you know, the Shemona Esrei, we say, our, you know, our God and God of our fathers. Um, you know, it's about that tension between, between making it your own, but having it be in dialogue with those who came before you and having that tension. Um, and you know the, the beauty about about that between that structure and improvisation is you know allows you to open up and become a vessel and in some ways that music is playing through you kind of just in the way and hopefully when you kind of achieve a state of communion in prayer you know you open up your you, you know hashem opens up your lips and the words come out of you uh, hopefully that's coming in there too um you know it's also a tremendous part about it though is that it's never just you and 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 jerry or, 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 or you and anyone else who wrote the music it's always also about the synergy between you and the players uh, who you're performing with. Just I think the band used to talk about being fingers on a hand. And you know, that's why it's so amazing to be able to play with all these people who I'm gonna, who I'm gonna get to play with in a little bit. I'm very excited um, too. And you know, together, you know, they they help you transcend kind of that, that, that division between self and other mm. and, and help explore. So like with, with, with Jerry, you know, or, or Billy, I, I gotta say to a large degree in my case, and, and Mickey, He's, you're, he's always with you and he's always flowing through you, but you know, you're playing along with him and you're adding kind of, just as if you were there with you, and you're adding your own vision and your own element as his is coming down. And you know, 
that's an amazing thing that, that you can do as a musician, and that's an amazing thing you can do also as a, as a, as a Jew with, with our tremendous tradition. Yeah, and I think that one of the, you know, there's, there's been lots of discussions on the, you know, the mini bands within the Grateful Dead. There was, you know, in a lot of ways a trio between Phil, Jerry, and Billy, and obviously there was, you know, Jerry and Bobby, and there was the drummers, all of these conversations. And that's something, if you think of on a, on a, a large level, you see in a, in a lot of different religious settings, especially Jewish ones, where there's different conversations going on in the communal space, whether it's, you know, someone in the pulpit to people um, who are praying, whether there's, you know, um, minions and groups together having experience. And it's a shared experience, but it's, it's individual experience, and there's kind of many communities in there. And to kind of add on to your point of what you were saying about um, interpreting the dead's music, I actually read a really interesting article today about um, kind of a, where classic rock is at kind of its waning days. And one thing they said that was interesting is that the bands who try to be as close to the original music, whether it's you know playing blues music if they're a classic rock band, or trying to recreate their own music 40 years later, feels so much less authentic than someone who does it completely yeah. different. Because that feels real, and I feel that, but I think in religious experiences in general, especially in, in Judaism, which we're talking about today, when you make it your own, you make it modern, it feels more impactful, more authentic. That's good. And look at Purim. This, yeah. is, this is a day here where, where we celebrate religiously in a mode that would seem so bizarre in any other holiday. Yeah. But you know, we come from a new perspective, and, and we feel very rejuvenated in our practice. I'm sure, too. Absolutely. Yeah, amen. I, w I would just say that that's what, we, I mean, that's what we try to accomplish. I mean, I think one of the reasons that a lot of people are put off by religious practice in general is it can feel just imposed upon you. And like you have to say exactly this in exactly this fashion, exactly this way. It doesn't provide the type of improvisational or personality that you bring to this. And so this is our Purim celebration this evening. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Noah, uh, for participating yeah. in this conversation. Thank you, Mike. I want to let you know that we are um, hosting, if you like the band Fish. Anyone here heard of Fish? Anyone here heard of that band? Uh, uh, so this Sunday at 11 o'clock at Brooklyn Bowl. Oh, they have a song called Esther or something? Uh, they do have a song called Esther. The band called Uncle Ebenezer is going to be hosting. So we're going to be doing uh, Grateful Dead Purim this evening. And on Sunday morning, we're family-friendly Uncle Ebenezer Fish Family Fun um, on Sunday morning. So thank you to Noah. Thank you to all of you. If you're interested in any groggers or home and find Wendy. Wendy, raise her hand. And um, you can find out more about our stuff on BecauseJewish.com. Thank you, Noah. And thank you to the Dave Bryan's band. Huge thanks to Dave Bryan. Yes. Friends. Thank you for inviting Dave us. Yeah, Thank you for letting us take over this space for a little bit of a slightly religious conversation, and we wish you all a happy Purim. Yeah. Yeah. And I say this isn't the first time Dave Bryan and friends have, have been in a religious context. This, you know, we we did our uh, um, live from the crypt show, yeah. uh, you know, in, in, in the sacred space of Wallyo, which was an amazing experience. And stay tuned. We hope to bring that experience back, even That's with right. a Jewish spin. That's so, right. Uh, it might involve some fire. All right. Take care. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Noah.